Today is August 28, 2023. We're doing an interview for the Ernestina Morrissey Matterport scan. My name is Jan De Silva. I'm the program manager of New Bedford Wheeling National Historical Park. I'm here with Julius Brito, who is president of the schooner Ernestina Morrissey Association. Mr. Brito, what's your connection and history with the Ernestina Morrissey? Everyone has their own story and reason for being involved with the Ernestina. My connection began 48 years ago, actually, in 1975, during the first independence of Cape Verde from Portugal. I sat around with the Freedom Fighters the night of independence on July 5th, and they turned to me and they said, what are you going to do? You're a Cape Verdean American. There was only four or five Cape Verdean Americans there in Cape Verde for the independence. I was speechless. What, what am I going to do? These guys put their life on the line. I'm just a probation officer. What, what can I do to talk about the independence of Cape Verde? Well, I said, you know, I don't know at this time, but I'm going to find something. And what I found was the Ernestine. Around the 10th of July, I went over to St. Vincent because the celebration began in Santiago and then moved over to St. Vincent. I stayed with uh, Pedro Almeida Paduca. We went over to Sant Anton for another get-together with John Peter Santos, and on the way, I saw the Ernestina in the harbor in Lindelo. I didn't know the significance of the Ernestina at the time, and Paducah pointed it out to me. It had no masts. It was unpainted. It looked terrible, to be honest. There was an old man living on board, pumping it out to keep it afloat. From that point, we move forward to 1976, when it was invited to the tall ships in New York by Mayor Abraham Beam. They hastily put it together in Cape Verde. They put the masts on. And this was because of Laura Pius Hester. She had talked with the government. She had information from another friend, Michael Platzer, who was in the UN. And he was going back and forth to West and East Africa for the UN. He saw the Ernestina. And he knew it as the Morrissey. He got in touch with Laura. Laura started talking with the government. Some other individuals in Rhode Island were working that end to try to repatriate the Ernestina. Aristides Pereira was the president of Cape Verde. And he listened to Laura and agreed that the government of Cape Verde should participate in the tall ships. About 11 hours out from Cape Verde, going to the tall ships in 1976, it got dismasted. I learned about that again with Ray Almeida. We were at a celebration for the 5th of July. He says, you know, the Ernestina never made it across the Atlantic because she got dismasted in a storm. The vessel went back to Cape Verde. The government made a decision at that point to fix the vessel up and send it to the United States as a gift. That was in 1976. They worked on it from 1976 until 1982. During that period of time, Governor Dukakis had made a commission for the Grenestina, and he appointed me as the first commissioner to uh, receive the vessel from Cape Verde. My role during the time from 76 to 82 was to be the liaison between William Baker who was the ship's architect for the article museum at MIT. He had read the Mayflower. He was on the commission with me, and he gave me plans. I would take them to the State Department. The State Department would pouch them over to Cape Verde. Cape Verde would continue to work on the vessel. We got pumps that they needed that they couldn't get elsewhere in Europe. We got nails from the Tremont Nail Factory in Wareham. They were the only factory in the country that had the square nails that were originally used in 1894 on the vessel. I remember walking into this old building at the nail factory and this old gentleman listened to my story about rebuilding the Uristina. And he says, I think there's some nails over there someplace. Check it out. And he let me go through these areas of the old factory. And I found some boxes of square nails that we were able to send over to Cape Verde. So there was a lot of things going on between 76 and 82 that we gathered funds. We did everything we could to help rebuild the vessel and send it over. In fact, my mother raised more funds doing different sales. We went out of Falmouth Heights over to Martha's Vineyard. 
with July Gonsalves and Cape Verdean bands on the Viking Queen. It, it was just a wonderful time to work on repatriating the vessel. In 1982, the vessel was uh, sailing from Cape Verde. I met with uh, Governor Dukakis and with Pedro Pires, who was the prime minister at the time. We talked about that it looks like in 1982, we're going to come over. The legislation had been all set up to receive the vessel from Cape Verde for the people of the United States through the Massachusetts Commission. It was thought that was the best way to do it because uh, we felt that Massachusetts is where it was launched and we should receive it for the people of the United States. It came in 1982 and they started out in July. It took 40 days and 40 nights to arrive in Newport with a crew of 14, seven Americans and seven Cape Verdeans, one woman on board. They had no engine because Enrique Mendes, who purchased the vessel in 1946, took the engine out. They had a harrowing experience. They talk about doldrums out in the ocean and sitting for days before they get any wind. They were able to get here. We had a ham radio operator. His name was Red Barber in Wareham, who kept in touch with Stefan Platzer. Michael Platz's brother, who was the radio operator on the Ernestina coming across. Laura and I would talk with Mr. Barber and find out where is she, what's she doing, and it arrived in August of 1982 to New Bedford. Cape Verde was a new country, brand new. They had no money to do this, but they did it. I have estimates between $1.5 and $2 million that it cost them over that period of time to rebuild it make it safe enough to get here. Uh, It's remarkable. What's your current relationship with the Ernestina Morrissey? In 2008, Bob Hilgerth, who was and has been a constant philanthropist for the vessel. In fact, I think it's his philanthropy that really brought this vessel over here. He got together with Marianne LeQuellen and talked about putting together a nonprofit. And SEMA, Schooner Ernestina Morrissey Association, was formed. Uh, Marianne and I worked with Linnea Michael at UMass School of Law. Linnea uh, and uh, Marianne and I uh, put together the SEMA bylaws with the purpose of raising funds to equip the vessel, to prepare it for a educational vessel and a cultural icon. Uh, and that was our mission statement. And in 2008, in 2009, we were fortunate enough to get a grant from the Island Foundation to put on a symposium at the Whaling Museum. 200 people came to that first initial symposium to rally around the issue of bringing Ernestina back to life. Because in 2005, she lost her certification so she could not sail anymore. I became the president of SEMA. Marianne was the secretary. Uh, Bob Hilders was the vice president. Luis Croto was our accountant and the treasurer. We had Melissa Duvall's, Manny Lopes, Derek Stevens, Willie Bank, who was a former captain on the Ernestina, Holly Sajak, who was a teacher on the Ernestina when it was sailing. We had Mike Gomes. We had you know, a cadre of people who were really interested and making sure that the vessel got repaired and was going to be able to sail again. Bob Hildreth's name is mentioned a lot. What's his connection to the Ernestina? He was the financial pump primer. Because of his philanthropy, a gentleman by the name of Jerry Lenfeth came in with substantial amount of funds. But he came in for two reasons. One, that the uh, Ernestina was going to have the added name of Morrissey, because that's how he knew the vessel as a young boy. He suggested or asked that the vessel be attached with the name Morrissey. So it became Ernestina Morrissey. And he came in because he saw what Bob Hildreth was doing. Bob Hildreth was putting his money in, maybe more than $2 million at the time. And he had a strong connection, Mr. Lundqvist did, to the Ernestina, and he said, well, I think that this is a worthy cause, and he put in, I think, about $6 million. The whole project cost over $12 million, and SEMA corralled 
I would say half of that, those funds, $6 million of those funds, this little group of people, all volunteers, gathered those funds from the Manton Foundation, from individuals, again, Bob Hildreth, Jerry Lenfest, the Island Foundation, John Bullard's Family Found Foundation. It was just amazing. And we had the help of both John Bullard and Matthew Stackpole. Matthew Stackpole is the historian for the Charles W. Warden. He and I worked on a lot of uh, fundraising. That's another reason why we were so successful. I remember hearing about Jerry Lenfist because his father was one of the Bartlett boys. No, his father was a philanthropist. He supported the policy. But Jerry, when he was around 12 or 13, he tells the story that he was on board the Morrissey with his father and was getting ready to go up to the North Pole or someplace, some exploration it was going to be doing. And Mr. Bartlett, Bob Bartlett, turned to Jerry Lenfett as a youngster and he said, when you get old enough, you're going to come on board with us and you're going to sail on the Morrissey. He said his eyes lit up. He was so anxious to do that. And then World War II came in 1942, and the vessel got conscripted into service, and it never went back to its exploration days. And so he never got to sail, but he always wanted to, and he saw the love his father had for the vessel. What do you see in the future for the Ernestina Morrissey? I felt that the Ernestina was a neutral, wonderful issue that had no sides, no political sides, no negative sides. It, it was just a positive issue that I could get involved with to tell the world about Cape Verde. Every place that that vessel sails to, it's going to be, what's this vessel all about? What's the history and so forth? It'll be the Morrissey history. It'll be its fishing history. It'll be its Cape Verdean history. What's Cape Verde? I'm sure people are going to say that. Recently, the vessel on its first voyage, shakedown voyage, went down to Tampa, Florida. I called my cousins, the Cabrals, and my best friend, the Andrews, Cape Verdeans. I said, hey, the vessel's coming to Tampa. You guys got to meet it. Sure enough, they met it. They brought my trooper, trooper and Gufong. They brought stuff on board. Captain Tiffany was so gracious to them. That was an example of what I feel that Ernestina will be able to do in the future. It'll be able to sail around and talk about Cape Verde, as well as other parts of its history. That is what I see for the Ernestina going forward. That and educating young people to all of its history and all of its culture. That, I think, is the legacy of the Ernestina Morrissey.